it's so good to see you all today. Well, we, this summer, we've been in the book of Colossians, and every week we learn from the Word of God. We know that the Bible shows us God's will and God's way for our life, and the more we get it in our heart, the more we get it in our life, the better our life is. God changes us, draws us closer to Him. We learn about God. We learn about Jesus from the Word of God. And so this summer, we've been going through the book of Colossians. And for those of you that are interested in this, the book of Colossians uh, was written by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the purpose of the book of Colossians was Paul wanted to show these people almost 2,000 years ago who they really were. He wanted them to see their identity in Christ. You don't identify, uh, you don't find out who you are simply by your culture, okay? Cultures are different. Cultures change, okay? And uh, certainly culture has influence on you, but that's not who you are. You're not even uh, who you are, and of course it is true to a degree, but you're not just who your family says you are. You're not who your successes say you are. You may think that your identity comes from how much money you make or how successful you are at your job. Now, those are important things, okay? But that's not where you get your identity from, who you are in Jesus Christ. You don't even get your identity from your failures. Now, here's the problem for many of us. We get our identity, and we don't admit this publicly, but in our minds we believe this because the devil gets on our shoulder and whispers in our ear, you're a failure. You, you've quit so many times. You're not going to be able to do that. You're not smart enough. You're not strong enough. And when we begin to understand who we are in Jesus Christ, you are who God says you are. All right? And so that's what we've been learning about uh, this summer in the book of Colossians. So today I want to talk to you on this thought how to have harmony in your home. What does your home look like? I realize that there is no perfect home. You can't have a perfect home. Many people today, when they get married, they think that all of life is just going to be like floating on a cloud. They think that everything is always going to be romantic, uh, that all you need is love. I believe they even wrote a song about that one time, right? All you need is love. Well, uh, tell that to the power company. Tell that to the people who you owe rent to. You're going to need something a little bit more than just love. And, and here's the thing. In our culture, we're taught uh, through movies and television and the stuff that we read, we're taught that marriage is a place for self-fulfillment. Marriage is a place where you find your soulmate, and as long as you feel like your heart pumps peanut butter every time you get around her, then everything is good. But how many times have we heard this said, well, I love her or I love him. I'm just not in love with him or her. And, and the truth is, uh, God shows a better way. You can't have a perfect marriage, but you can't have a good marriage. And you can have one that brings glory to God. And you can have one that is fulfilling in your own life, okay? So, uh, as we get started today, I want to give you just a couple of stories to get started that kind of illustrate what we're talking about. The first one, and both of these are true stories, the first one, uh, there was a family where I grew up. I grew up in, uh, outside of Mount Airy, North Carolina, that's where Andy Griffith is from, and uh, Surrey County, it was out in the country, and uh, there were a lot of funny things that happened out in that part of the world. Uh, there was, not too far from my house, there was this little white house, and out next to it, I'm, when I say next to it, 10 feet from it, there was a mobile home right next to it. It was the oddest looking thing, because you had a little white house that it was obvious that somebody was living in, and right in front of it, almost touching it, was a mobile home. Well, it turns out there's this family, this couple that lived there, and they couldn't stand each other. In fact, they could only hang around each other for a little bit before they got in an argument. And uh, they weren't about to get divorced, but this husband and wife, 
they figured out that what they were going to do was that the wife lived in the little white house and the husband lived in the trailer. I'm talking about right next to each other and they would eat supper together sometimes and they kind of saw each other a little bit, but they had no harmony in their home. And in fact, it became almost a uh, a joke in our community. Everybody, every time when we drive by there, yep, there's that couple that can't get along. And yet they were probably the most honest couple in our county, okay? Because there's a whole lot of people that were living under the same roof that had no harmony in their home. Now you can have harmony without being perfect, okay? You can have harmony even though uh, you both are fallen and have a sinful nature. Okay, I'm going to give you another story, and this is an absolutely true story. It's about my grandparents, uh, my mom's mom and dad, Wendell and Dorothy Phillips. My, I did both of their funerals. My grandpa died at around 72, and my grandmother was around 90 when she died. They met many, many years ago. Um, they'd never met before. And my grandmother had moved out of her house and she was working, living in a little boarding place where they had a restaurant. And she was working there. Uh, she was one of 12 children that lived uh, for a while, at least under the same roof. And, and she was 14 years old and she moved out of her house. And she moved into this little uh, place and she worked at this restaurant. My grandpa uh, was around 17 or 18 years old at the time. I think he was 18. And he was working on his, on his dad's farm, and, and he comes in to have a meal on a Monday night. And um, he met my grandmother, Dorothy, uh, Dorothy Wagner at the time. They met on a Monday night, and he began to flirt with her, and she was a beautiful, beautiful young woman. And uh, that Friday, they got married. Do you think I'm making that up? I am not. They met on a Monday. They got married on a Friday. And they almost made it. They were only married for 55 years. Okay? Until he died. Now, that, that's a beautiful story. Okay? Now, here's the thing uh, to let you know that they never lost that spark. Uh, my grandpa, when he was in his late 50s, he had a heart attack for the first time. He had several heart attacks. But they rushed him to the hospital. And my grandmother was a very, uh, how shall I say, uh, she was uh, very frantic at times, okay? Uh, she was a little bit, would just kind of lose it at the littlest thing. My grandpa was always calm, cool, and collected, calm as a cucumber. But my grandmother would be kind of frantic at times. And so, uh, she was frantic, as you can certainly imagine. My grandpa had, had a heart attack. He was in his 50s. And so they're, they're, they're at the emergency room. And uh, the doctors told our family that they had to shock my grandfather back to life. He died on the, on the table there in the emergency room. They shocked him back to life. And my grandmother, uh, she's like, oh, my goodness. And she goes in to see him finally. And my grandpa's stable at the time. And she says, oh, Wendell, I, yeah, I heard that you died. She oh, my goodness. She said, did you see a light and go toward the light? And my grandpa said, well, no, I didn't see a light. He said, but for a second, I thought I saw the devil. <laughs> and she goes, oh, no. He goes, don't worry, I woke up and it was just you. <laughs> now, here's the question. What kind of home? You, they didn't have a perfect home by a uh, by long stretch. But you can have a home that brings glory to God and have harmony in the home. Let me tell you just a few things for you note takers so you don't, your head doesn't explode. I got some blanks and I need to tell you these so you don't come up to me afterwards and say, what was that? Fill in the blank for me. And I have to go look at my notes and like, I forgot what I said. God knows, when it comes to following God's instructions, which we're going to read today, God knows what is best because he created us. Will we agree with that? The creator, the one who knows everything, the one who can see the future, he knows what is best for us. That's why we follow the word of God, okay? 
Um, and then God's instructions are always for our good and for God's glory. Now, the Bible tells us some things that, quite frankly, at times we don't want to obey. And I always like to use this one. The Bible says, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Now, let me ask you, ask you a question. Have you ever felt like not being kind? Have you ever felt like not forgiving? Look, I'm a preacher. I realize that some of you think that preachers are perfect. I am not, okay? I have a wonderful, wonderful wife. I have a wonderful, wonderful marriage. Kim and I have been married for 37 years, and we love each other, and we really, really do get along most of the time. We got a piece of furniture uh, just this past week uh, to go in our house, and it was one of those things that you, you ever buy something online that you haven't actually sat in, that you actually haven't seen, and it looks so good, but when it gets there, it's got to be put together? Oh, oh, and, you know, they make it sound so simple. All I had to do was get it to fit into these grooves, and the screws were unloosed and all this kind of stuff. And I was trying to get that chair put together. I'm talking about this past week, okay? I was trying to get that chair put together, and I could not get it together. I was sweating. I'd actually hurt my hand trying to get the stupid thing together. And my wife, bless her heart, uh, wives, can I give you just a, a little piece of advice? When your husband is about to explode already when the veins are sticking out on his forehead because he's so angry at something, don't take it personally because if you try to get involved, he's going to get mad at you. And my wife gave me some suggestions, which I did not appreciate, okay, and um, let her know it. And uh, she was like, what are you taking it on for me for? And your pastor your man of God full of faith and power threatened to throw that brand new chair out into the backyard. Now, thank God that we got over it and we still have harmony in our home. Okay? But understand this. God's instructions for you are for your good and for His glory. And then our sin nature causes us to want to rebel. Has that ever dawned on you? The reason we don't want to do what God says often is because we're just rebellious. We have a sin nature. We think we want to do it our way, just like a little child that you tell them not to touch the remote control, and they look at you after 15 times. You've said, don't do it, or I'm going to spank you. They will reach out one finger. They're not going to pick it up, but they're going to reach out one little finger and just touch it. They're rebellious at heart, just like you and me. Okay? So, but God tells us that we can have shalom. Now, that's the biblical word. It's a Hebrew word, and it means peace, but it means more than that. It's peace and harmony, and it's talk, it talks about being blessed physically, being blessed financially, being blessed in your whole life. In other words, you have a wholeness and a completeness to your life with shalom. And this is what God is promising, that if you'll do what he says, he will bless your life. He will bless your home with shalom. That's what we want, okay? And so how do we have shalom in the home? That kind of rhymes, doesn't it? Shalom in the home. That sounds like, a, for those of you old enough to remember Muhammad Ali, that sounds like something that he would say, you know, rumble in the jungle or you know, shalom in the home or whatever. Um, obviously, a lot of you are younger than I am, so uh, you didn't get that. How many ever saw Muhammad Ali box? A few of you, okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Well, let me quit yapping and let's read what the Bible says. Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through chapter 4, verse 1. 
And he starts off with something that causes women in our culture to cringe, but it shouldn't because I'm going to explain it to you. Wives, submit to your husbands. And not a single man said amen because you are wise. <laughs> you want harmony when you get home. You don't want to get in a fight. But notice what he says, as is fitting in the Lord. Now, ladies, don't let this bother you. Throw it. I'm going to explain it. But then he tells something to the husbands. Husbands, love your wives. In Ephesians, the, the uh, same author of Colossians wrote Ephesians, and he said, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's the kind of love that God's talking about. And do not be harsh with them. Man, that's a hard one. Especially when your brain is geared for sarcasm. As is mine. I am so good at it. And, and, and I can make somebody feel about that big with my old sinful self. But he says, husbands, don't be harsh. Don't be harsh. Then he goes on. Children, obey your parents in everything. I realize our children aren't in here. Uh, our youth, or many of them are serving in the back. We, our children are in the back. Thank God for our children's ministry. Wonderful, wonderful thing. But children, obey your parents, not in some things, but in everything. That would go a long way in getting harmony in the home, would it not? Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this pleases the Lord. Okay, this is what he says. It pleases God when you do that. Then he goes on. Fathers, he's talking about discipline here. Do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. He gives us a way to talk to our kids. Don't discourage them. And then bond servants. Uh, let me explain this because uh, in the time that the New Testament was written, most of it was written in the first century A.D., nearly 2,000 years ago, um, the culture was quite different than it is now. Um, when you see the word bondservant, that was someone that was a willing servant. Uh, they would actually have their ear pierced uh, against a, a doorpost with an awl, and they'd wear an earring that it showed their loyalty and their love to the person that employed them, okay? So the, um, the, the, the nearest thing that we can have in our culture is uh, an employer-employee relationship. I realize that you probably don't love your boss that much, okay? But uh, so a bond servant was someone who willingly was in that employment, willingly served, okay? So this was not a coerced thing. So he says, bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Now, we don't use that terminology now, but that was what they used back then. So understand that the Bible is in no way condoning the kind of slavery that we're uh, uh, familiar with, okay? He says, uh, you obey them in everything. He says, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord... Not your boss, not your company, not from your employer, but from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Remember, your boss is not the chain of command at work. Your boss is Jesus. That's what he's saying. You'll have a transformation. And by the way, you say, what does this have to do with harmony in the home? When you have harmony like this at your work, it brings peace in the home, okay? It's hard to be at peace fully in the home and to have shalom if you have an awful relationship at work. And I realize that work is work and nobody has a perfect place to work, but he's saying that no matter what your job is, you do your best. You serve the Lord at work. 
And then he goes on, he says, uh, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. There is no partiality. And then he says masters. He's talking about employers, not employees, but business owners, people who are bosses, people who employ. So notice what he did, okay? Notice what he did. He says, wives, you've got a role. Husbands, you've got a role. Children, you've got a role. Discipline has a role. Uh, your work has a role of having harmony in the home. And even the employer has a role. Okay, so six things have a role uh, to have harmony in the home. He says, masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So let me just kind of go down that list that we saw there, and you can uh, take this home, and hopefully it will be a help to you. The first question is, how can a wife bring harmony in the home? Well, he says, wives, submit to your husbands. Uh, submission, I realize in our culture, there are a lot of people that uh, they don't know what they're talking about when they say that the Bible teaches that women are to be subservient to men. That is not what the Bible teaches at all. In fact, if you know anything about the culture in which this was written, women at that time worldwide had no rights. In the Roman Empire, they couldn't vote. They couldn't own things. They could not run a business. They couldn't even work publicly for the most part because they had no rights, okay? But it was Jesus Christ that took us back to God's intention for husbands and wives and men and women to live in harmony. You see, Jesus, even though he was alive during that time when women had almost zero rights, do you know who the first people were that witnessed the resurrection, that would take this witness to the entire world? It was women. Did you know that during that time, women's uh, testimony was not even allowed in court? They had no rights. What did Jesus do? He elevated women. He let people to know. Who, you know, the same person that wrote, wives, submit your husbands, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he also wrote this in a couple of places. He said uh, in Christ that there is neither uh, male or female. In other words, not one better than the other. Uh, there is neither bond or free. There is neither Jew or Gentile. And what he was saying was this. In Christ, we are all equal. We are all even. Now, let me explain to you why that word should not upset anyone, even, I would say, a feminist, okay? Here's the thing. The Bible tells us in multiple places that we are to submit to one another. In fact, in a couple places where this is used, uh, where it says, wives, submit to your husbands, right before it says, wives, submit to your husbands, it also says, husbands, submit to your wife. Now, why does he use this terminology? Well, the word submit means to respect. It's a military term that means to rank under, okay? Um, the church I grew up in had a man uh, that went to it. His name was Troy Johnson, and Troy Johnson was a drill instructor in the Marines during World War II. This dude was a tough, tough dude. As you can imagine, back in those days, um, he was very serious about a lot of things, but mostly he was serious about being a Marine, all right? They were tough, tough dudes. Well, he told a story to me one time about a young man. Uh, he was an enlisted man, and uh, there was a man that was younger than he was, college graduate, that was an officer. He was a lieutenant. And this man, who was an enlisted man, refused, because the guy was younger than him, refused to salute him. And you know, you, in the military, you've got to be serious about stuff like that, okay? So he would not salute this lieutenant. And his drill instructor saw what was going on. And he's like, soldier? He probably used words like maggot or something like, maggot, what are you doing? You know, back in those days when they were really tough. 
All right, so he's like, he gets onto this guy. And he says, why aren't you saluting your superior officer? He's like, well, that dude's younger than me. He said, well, that doesn't matter. He said, you need to respect your officers. And here's what this man said. He said, I will salute the uniform all day long, but I will not salute that man. And his drill instructor said, that is a great idea. And he made him stand out. And it was raining when he went out, okay, for 24 straight hours. He had to stand out in the rain at night during the day. And his drill instructor hung a uniform uh, on a rack and it's standing out there. And he's like, good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. For 24 straight hours. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that man had a problem with respecting uh, his superior officers after that? No way. You know why? He learned that you got to rank under and bring respect. Doesn't mean that you agree with everything. Now, ladies, let me tell you what this does not say. Uh, when it says submit to your own husbands, it doesn't say submit to all men. It doesn't say that you can't lead. It doesn't say that you can't uh, own a business. It doesn't say that you have to be home barefooted and pregnant. It doesn't say any of that. In fact, if you understand the whole point of what God is teaching us about the home is that we both have to die to self, husband and wife, we die to self and therefore we submit to the other. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The husband is to submit to the wife physically, and the wife is to submit to the husband physically as well. It is a mutual submission. And by the way, did you know this, ladies? Your man has a top five emotional needs list, and so do you, okay? Do you know what is at the top, at least first or second, in the absolute majority of men? And they, you know, whoever they are that do these studies, they figure this stuff out. Do you know what the top, in the top one or two things that your husband needs? Respect. Now, that doesn't mean women don't need respect, but let me just tell you something. Most likely, your husband has, has not even occurred to him if you have not mouthed the words, I loved you in the last two weeks. It probably hasn't even dawned on him that you haven't said that because he does not receive emotionally in the same way that you do. Did you know that? Do you know what your husband needs more than anything? Do you know what will cause your husband uh, to be the knight in shining armor that you want, to be the one that will fight for you, that will do everything that Jesus said he's supposed to do, you know what will cause him to want to do that is when you bring respect to the marriage. You say, well, he doesn't deserve it. The Bible didn't say submit if he deserves it because I got news for you. We don't do things because we deserve them or others deserve them. Do you think we deserve the love of God? No. Do you think that you always deserve 100% of the time the absolute selfless love, the self-sacrificing love of your husband? No. Okay? And the point is this. When we do what the Bible says, it changes everything. Well, here's the second question. Uh, how can a husband bring harmony um, in the home? Well, it's clear that he says, husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. Um, in the book of Ephesians, the apostle Paul wrote this. He said, uh, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. That is a self-sacrificing, self-denying love. Once again, God has called you to marriage not for you to have a soulmate and to be self-fulfilled. He has called you to marriage to serve the other. And only when we understand that will we have a good marriage. Only when we truly understand that will we be able to navigate the rocky terrain of marriage, the difficult waters of marriage. Because 
we've got to do what God says in the Word of God. If we don't, we're not going to have shalom. We're not going to have peace in the home. So what does he say? Wives, respect your husband. Husband, love your wife. A self-sacrificing, self-denying love that dies to self. And he says, do not be harsh with them. Um, I'm probably like many men that I can be very harsh without meaning to be. I have to watch my tone. You know, the truth is, I'm just a loud person a lot of times, okay? And, and sometimes I get loud because I'm mad at a situation, and I am not mad at my wife, not in the least. But I promise you that I can get all upset over stuff going on around me. You know what I'm saying? All right? I, I can get upset. And here's what God said. Husbands, don't be harsh. Don't be harsh. Learn to be kind. By the way, did you know, and I truly believe this, that the vast majority of marital problems could be resolved if you just do one thing. Be kind to each other. That is so important. And God says, husbands, don't be harsh. Don't be a smart aleck. Don't be caustic. Uh, don't be sarcastic. Don't be harsh. Because your wife is not going to receive it the same way that you do. Wives, you may not know this, but men, for the most part, and I realize we live in a little bit of a different culture now, but men, for the most part, like to be harsh with each other. And they're not really being mean, they're just being dudes, you know? I mean, the fact is, uh, two best friends can call each other names. What are you doing, buffalo breath? And that's a, that's a very intimate greeting between two friends, two men. But if a woman were to say that to another woman, what are you doing, buffalo breath? They would never speak to each other again. In fact, the one that she said that to would go on Facebook and try to destroy her reputation. Right? Okay. Well, God says, husbands, don't be harsh. Men, um, you got to learn to speak to your wife. And it helps bring harmony in the home. Uh, number three, how can children bring harmony? The Bible says, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. I don't have time really to develop this, and our kids aren't in here anyway, so uh, we'll go on to the next point. Uh, how should you discipline your children? Here's what he said. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Look, I, I could spend a lot of time on this, okay? And maybe I should, uh, but the word provoke means to cause someone to feel resentment or bitterness. You can speak to your kids in a way that causes them to be resentful. I get that. Now, maybe you don't discipline your children the way you were disciplined growing up. I know when I was growing up, I got the ever-living crap beat out of me on a regular basis, okay? You say, are you bitter? Nope. Do you love your parents? More than life itself. Do you respect your parents? Yep. Am I resentful toward my parents? No. I didn't get enough spankings growing up. I'll just be honest, okay? Now, it's not that I just kept disobeying. It's just that there are so many things they didn't tell me not to do. And I do that, and then I get in trouble for that, okay? But this idea of discipline, we discipline our children by bringing them to church. We discipline, that doesn't mean that's punishment. You, that, the word discipline is to disciple. That's what it means. It's the same root word. Disciple your children. Reading the book of Deuteronomy, it, it tells us we're to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And when we walk by the way, when we get up in the morning, when we go to bed at night, in every part of our life, we're to teach our children to fear God. That's discipline, but it's also discipling our children. We disciple our children by biblical discipline. Biblical discipline, Look, get, get the word, okay? Uh, and there are several words that describe biblical discipline or correction. It's teaching. 
you got to teach your kids. It's training and it's consistent accountability. We're, we're not perfect as parents, but have you ever warned your kid, if you do that again, you're in trouble, and they do it 15 more times, and you keep on saying, if you do that again, you're in trouble. Well, you've taught them that you're a liar. They don't believe you, okay? You've got to be consistent. You've got to be consistent. Let me read just a few verses. Proverbs 13, 24, if you don't punish your children, you don't love them. If you do love them, you will correct them. Once again, the Bible doesn't condone abuse, even though the Bible does condone the use of corporal punishment. A spanking, as many of us can attest, is not going to crush your kid. And, and look, there's a reason that so many people are afraid. I realize that we live in a different culture. And, and part of the fear that comes from parenting today is because of how our society is structured. Let me explain. Uh, when I was growing up and my grandparents' generation and my great-grandparents' generation, you know what most people had in their life? They had a support network. It was called family. Because mom and dad and grandparents and uncles and aunts and cousins pretty much lived all in the same place. And when somebody had a baby, guess what happened? They had an entire support network. They didn't freak out. I remember my mom talking about my great-grandmother of how many times, and even my grandmother, how many times they helped her with me because she was a bit of a loss with me. Uh, I would have been what you call a difficult child. But because she had my grandma family around, she didn't freak out. Now, at World War II and beyond, people began to move away, and families, for the most part, did not live intact in the same community. And I see many of you, and I know you're in the same boat that I am. We live, obviously, in Georgia. My parents live in North Carolina. My wife's mother, her father's dead, but uh, her, my wife's mother and her brothers live in Florida. Uh, we have two daughters that live in Georgia, but they're all a long ways away from us. And we have a son that lives in North Carolina. So uh, for many people, they don't have that family really close to them. That's that support network. And therefore, you freak out over things that it's normal to freak out over. Even though there have been billions of babies born in the history of the world, this is your first or this is your baby. And so just because billions have already experienced this doesn't mean you have. It's new to you, you know. I can remember Kim and I, how excited, and I mean excited. I'm using the word excited that we got when Brittany, who was our firstborn, first pooped in her diaper. Now, as I get older, I don't think anybody will get excited if they find out that I pooped in my diaper, okay? So because, you know, I should be old enough not to do that, all right? But do you get my point that you got to be consistent? And it's difficult sometimes when you don't have family around, but listen closely. That's why you need church. That's why you need small group. Because even though you may not have your parents or your grandparents around, which is really kind of sad. My children grew up like that, grandparents in two different states. But you know what I did have? I had a church family. And man, they were such a help. And the same is true for you. Even if your children are grown, guess what? You need a church family, right? Small group, church. Hebrews 12, 11, being punished isn't enjoyable while it is happening. It hurts, but afterwards we can see the result, a quiet growth in grace and character. God says, discipline your kids. Proverbs 23, 13 and 14, don't hesitate to discipline children. A good spanking won't kill them. As a matter of fact, it may save their lives. And, and that is not, that's not hyperbole there. 
it literally will save their life because you are disciplining them, you are training them, you are instilling character in them, all right? Now, let, let me get to these last two things and we're done. Uh, how do you develop a work-home balance? He said servants and he told us what to do. Uh, let, let me just give you a couple of thoughts here. Um, let, me, let me read from the message. And, and don't just do the minimum that will get you by. Do your best. Work from the heart for your real master. For God, uh, confident that you'll get paid in full when you come into your inheritance, keep in mind always that the ultimate master you're serving is Christ. The sullen servant who does shoddy work will be held responsible. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. Amen. Now, you know what that tells me? And our younger people, please listen to me. You probably, the first job you're going to get is probably not going to be your dream job. Most likely. I worked a lot of different jobs before I got into my dream job of being in the ministry. I worked at a pharmaceutical company. Uh, I worked at a temp agency. I worked at a Hess gas station. I did roofing. I did yard work. I worked on a farm. I did so many different things. I was even a telemarketer for uh, one semester of my senior year of college. My job was to call, uh, and you younger people don't know what this is, long distance. That was back in the day when you had to choose your long distance company. Uh, the, the Supreme Court had decided to break up the big mothership, you know, um, and we had to call every number in America to ask them, do you want to keep at and I know some of you are like, what is he talking about, All right? Um, but you're probably not going to get your dream job when you first start. But according to Scripture, you need to do your best, no matter what it is. Let me give you principles. Go above and beyond. If you do that, you'll get advancement. Remember that you work for Jesus, no matter the job, even if it's one you don't like. Cultivate a good attitude at work. Very, very important. The better your attitude, the better opportunities you're going to get. And then do your best at every job. Every job. Every job. Every job. God says, do your best. And then finally, what does God say to employers? Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And what is he saying? He's saying, be fair. Be just. I realize that sometimes you deal with difficult circumstances, okay? You're probably going to have some young or maybe old employees that think the moment that they arrive that they deserve the VIP parking, a brand new company car, and make as much money as the owner. You're going to have some people, because they have entitlement attitude, are going to think that. You've got to deal with that. I know that. But here's what the Bible tells us. Remember to be fair. Be fair. And remember that Jesus is watching. And uh, when we do that as an employer, we'll, we'll be fine. Okay? So this is what God says. He says to have harmony in the home. Wives, you've got a role. Husbands, you've got a role. Children, you've got a role. Discipline in the home has a role. Your life work, work home balance, that's got a role. And if you're an employer, that's got a role as well. Well, my prayer for you is that you can find harmony in your home. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, help us to follow your word. Thank you for the richness of it. Thank you how practical it is. Thank you how it speaks to us. But Lord, most of all, help us to obey it. Help us to follow it. I pray that you would bring shalom in the home. That you would bring peace and harmony in our homes. God, we know that you will when we obey your word. Now, before I finish my prayer, 
online today, do you need to receive Jesus as your Savior? If you do, it's very simple. You give your life to him. Pray something like this. Dear God, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross and rose from the grave for me. I need you to forgive my sins. I'm not perfect. I can't do this on my own. So I'm asking you to come into my life and to save me and be the Lord of my life. If you prayed that prayer or you want to pray that prayer right now, click the button at the bottom of the screen as you watch. For those of you in the room, please take your next step card and before you leave today, drop it in the drop box on the way out. Any uh, next step cards, whatever it is, the drop box on the way out, you can drop it in there. And we'll be able to know that you made a spiritual decision today. Maybe you need to take your next step soon. We don't really do this during the summer, but soon we're going to have a next step class if you'd like to go through that. We're going to have ways for you to get involved in a small group. Uh, we'll start that uh, to middle to the end of August. Um, there are ways always for you to get involved in serving here at this church. And we need you. And not only do we need you, you need the church. You need to be involved. God says to use your gift, and when you do, it's very fulfilling. So I hope you'll take your next steps, whatever they are, and um, I believe God will bless you. Heavenly Father, help us today as we leave and go our separate ways to obey Scripture, to follow you, and to see you work richly in our lives, and to give us shalom in our home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.